we've been equipped with these amazing tools, eyes, which allow us to engage in science, which is basically the observation and questioning of the natural world around us. I wanted to talk a bit about colour, because I think colour plays an important role in a lot of things that we don't understand very well. So, for example, <laughs> has anybody ever wondered why a glass of red wine is red? Yep. Take my white light, shine it through the red wine, and it appears to be red. Well, it's, when I was taught about colour, we were taught that colour is basically it's additive. We've got three primary colours, don't we? We've got red, we've got blue, and we've got green. And when you add them together, that makes white. But actually, that's not the way that colours appear or colours are formed in nature. The way that we see colour is a brain applying some calculation to the intensity of light that we receive in each of these spectra, and from that, calculating what the colour we are looking at is. So, sunlight is additive, and the way that we see colour is additive, but actually the way that colours are created in nature is not additive. It's subtractive. If I take my white light and I shine it through a green filter, you get green. The other colours of the spectrum have been subtracted from that light. Same with blue and the same with red. But where we get crossover, where we subtract more than one colour, such as red and green, you actually don't get very much left at all because you're taking away most of the light. Okay? So colours in nature are created by subtraction from white light, which is actually counterintuitive to the way that most of us are taught to think about colour, which is additive, the colours of the rainbow. And when we understand that, we can understand some interesting things about physics of materials. Now, I can demonstrate this a little bit better, I think, because in my pocket I've got three coloured lasers. I've got a 535 nanometer green, 650 nanometer red, and a 405 nanometer blue. So if I take my, start with the red, okay, and my glass of red wine. I've got to be careful here because I can't shine the reflection of this into your eyes, so I've got to point it in this direction so it reflects back at me. Um, red light, hopefully you can see it on the screen, through the glass with no obstruction, through the, um, try and point it, it's, uh, there we go, you can still see the red spot on the screen, Okay, it's attenuated compared to the clear glass, and there's quite a lot of reflection coming back at me, but you can see there is clearly a red spot on the screen. Red light passes through red wine. Blue light, yeah, nice blue spot on the screen, move it down, oh, it disappears completely. And actually, no matter what I do, I can't make a blue spot appear on the screen through a glass of red light, uh, red, red wine. I shall drink the rest of it in a moment. <laughs> green, exactly the same. So we lose the green light into the red wine. What's happening is that in here, there are a bunch of molecules that get really excited about blue and green. And they absorb it. But they don't like red at all. So it just goes straight through. So actually, that's not a glass of red wine. That's a glass of don't like red wine. So we take this power of observation and we apply it in the built environment. We start to ask questions. Why? When I travel to Mediterranean countries where it's quite sunny, and probably some of you have done this as well, you notice the predominance of bright red clay tile roofs. Clay is available for making roof tiles all over. But it strikes me that if you look at buildings of a similar history in the UK, which use tiled roofs, even before you allow for the lichens and the, um, the weathering, that the material colour is much darker. So can we think about and identify a reason why you would preferentially select a bright red tile in a sunny country and a darker red tile in a not so sunny country? Well, I've got a tile, got a nice bright red tile, and I got three coloured lasers. What do you think we should do with them? <laughs> okay. 
I was wondering, I was really wondering how I was going to do this. I didn't know what the screen would be like. I didn't know what the specularity. This is actually a back projection screen, which is really terrible because um, it's got no surface reflection, so it doesn't pick up these lights. But really luckily for me, the manufacturer who sent me this sample stuck a paper label on it. And the paper label has got a very similar surface specularity to the clay tile itself. So any differences that we see between the paper and the tile will be due to the properties of the material, not a change in surface reflectance. Okay? So, as you would expect, perhaps red light, paper to tile. There's actually a little bit of attenuation, but very little. Blue light, uh, heavily attenuated between the tile and the paper. And green light, again, not so heavily attenuated, but reasonably attenuated between the paper and the tile. So what that's telling us is that this tile is appearing red because it's actually absorbing blue and green light. Okay. What's the significance about it absorbing blue and green but not red? Well, if you remember your spectrum that I had up just now, red and infrared are very close together in the spectrum. Infrared is heat. So if we've got a product which by its material character reflects red light and heat, wouldn't it be natural to assume that over a period of generations and generations of experimentation with habitation, that bright red tiles would become preferentially selected in hot countries, and duller tiles which do absorb would become preferentially selected in cold countries. So perhaps we're seeing evidence here of <coughs> intrinsic material properties that we don't yet understand and we haven't yet identified, but were empirically discovered and known about by historic builders. <coughs>